Well, um, here we are. Open your Bibles. You can grab your Bibles and flip to uh, Mark chapter 12 is where we're going to start today, Mark chapter 12. And, and I'm not um, about to uh, redo what Darren already did in leading us in worship. And thank you, Darren, for doing that. I appreciate that. Um, but um, as I was thinking and praying about what to uh, preach about today, um, there was one night I was getting ready for bed, and as I laid down, this song uh, came to my heart, came to my mind. And it's the song, uh, Heart of Worship. And it's communicating uh, that when everything's kind of stripped away, uh, what really matters is what is left. And so I just want to sing a portion of the song uh, for us this morning as we kick off our time together. Um, before we do that, let's just pray. Let's just take a moment and pray. Father, I just, um, I just thank you for this moment that you're allowing us to share together um, at home and online. And God, we are still here. Um, we are still here to worship you and to hear from you. And so I pray that you'd use these moments that we share together, that you'd speak your word, that you'd use my words to communicate what you want to communicate, God. That Holy Spirit, you would empower this moment that we share together. In Jesus' name, amen. When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That'll bless your heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. Amen. Well, I think there's, um, I think that song came to mind because it seems like we're in a season where so many things are kind of getting stripped away and and what is left is, is what really matters. And so I was just thinking about what is it that really matters? What is it that, um, that is the main thing that we can hold on to in this time? And I think whenever Jesus was asked that question in, in Mark chapter 12 uh, by a Pharisee, he was asked the question, what is it that really matters? What is the greatest commandment of all? And this is um, kind of what he shared with them. Mark chapter 12 uh, verse 28 through 31. And one of the scribes came and heard uh, them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. That is a fascinating. That he, he says when it's all boiled down, it really all matters. What matters is if you're loving God with everything and if you're loving your neighbor as yourself, that's what really matters. And uh, I think in a time right now, we're told all of the things that we can't do. We're told we can't, um, can't go to work and can't go to school and we can't uh, go on vacation and we can't fly and we can't shake hands and we can't gather more than 10 people and we can't go to church. And it seems like there's so many things that we cannot do. And um, this pandemic has really interrupted and disrupted our daily lives and our daily routines. And if you're like me, you might be asking, what now? I mean, what now? What is, 
What does my routine look like now? What does my prayer life look like now? What does my relationship with my church look like now? And what does my relationship with my small group look like right now? Maybe you're asking, what now? And, um, and so in a time where so many things are being pulled away from us, hey, maybe this is actually the time where we're being uh, put through a process uh, to test how our personal devotion uh, really is. You know, when, whenever everything is ripped away, what is our relationship with God really like? And uh, I think when everything's taken away, there's still a handful of things that we can do. There's still the basics, the essentials, the main things that we can still hold on to, and I want to give them to you today, okay? So here's the first one, is that we can pray. That as the people of God, we not only can pray, but we should be praying. We need to be praying. We need to be people of prayer because prayer uh, changes things. Prayer moves and shifts things. In James chapter 5, there's this beautiful passage on prayer. And he talks about if you're sick and if you need prayer and come to the elders and they'll anoint you and they'll pray over you. And he talks about um, confessing your sin to one another and praying for one another and forgiveness and all of these things. And it's in the context of that passage in James chapter 5, verse 16, where it says, The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. That, That our prayers, I think one of the reasons that we don't pray is because we don't see things happening. That prayer, like exercise, takes uh, time to work. It's not going to be instant uh, most of the time. But if you keep at it, keep persisting, keep prayer, you'll see that prayer works, that prayer changes things, that prayer shifts things in the spiritual realm. And we need to be people of prayer right now. We need to be people who are praying, praying for our country and praying for our nation and our people. We need to be praying. And um, one of the things that prayer does, it's very relevant in this time, in a time where we have so much anxiety and fear in our lives, prayer brings peace. There's a very famous passage in Philippians chapter 4 that you might know um, because uh, it says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything. Can we just let that sit there for a minute? The word of God telling us, don't be anxious about anything. Well, why not? There's so much to be anxious about. Yeah, yeah. In this world where there's so much to be anxious about, the people of God don't have to be anxious. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love that. He's like, if you're anxious, if you're fearful, pray and let the peace of God wash over your soul. So prayer brings peace. We need to be people of prayer. We can pray. And I know many of you, some of you, you pray regularly and you have good prayer habits, but there's a lot of us that... um, that struggle to pray and find it very difficult. And so if that's you, I wanna just give you a few practical tips on prayer. The first is find a place to pray. Find a place where you can get away and be alone with the Lord. Jesus gave uh, this advice uh, on prayer in Matthew chapter six, verse six, where he says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. What he's saying is, is go find a place. Go find a place where you can get away, and it can be private, and you can be alone with the Lord, and there you pray. A place of solitude, uh, a place of silence. Um, See, here's what I know, and probably what you know, is that surface-level conversations happen in public, 
surface level conversations happen in public. So if you're like in your, you're in a crowded lobby and you meet one of your friends and, and, and you're like, you, you start, hey, how you doing? How's your mom and them? And you're like, surface level catch up happens in public. But if you want to get deep with somebody, if you want to have an intimate conversation, if you want to really get to know someone, you, you're, you're like, hey, can we, can we get alone? Can, can I pull you aside? Can we get into this room over here? Because I want to talk to you about something that's really precious, that's really deep, that's really secret. And, uh, and in the same way, if we're going to have, we can have surface level conversations with God, uh, with our family, we can, when we pray with our family, when we pray um, with our small group, when we pray at church, when we pray before meals, those are, we can have surface level conversations with God and that's okay. But if we want to have deep conversations, if we want to get intimate with God, if we want to go to next level prayer, we need to find a place where we can get alone and be alone with him. And that's where we have deep conversations with the Lord. And the second thing is to find, find a time, like make a time for it. Um, see, important things uh, get put on your calendar. Important things get put on your calendar. If you have a, a very important doctor's uh, appointment, one, you're going to make an appointment, and then you're going to put it on your calendar, and you're going to meet the appointment because it's important. If um, you want to go on a date with your wife, you, you might put it on the calendar, and this is when we're going to go out, and it's important, so you put it on the calendar. If um, you want to go to a nice dinner, you're going to call ahead, you're going to make a reservation because it's important, and you're going to put it on your calendar, you're going to meet the reservation. Because here's the thing, you don't have to make a reservation to go to McDonald's. You don't have to make a reservation to go to Ward's, okay, right? Because those things aren't quite as special, aren't quite as important as um, maybe a nice fancy dinner that you'd make a reservation for. And so the point is this, that important things get put on your calendar. And so set a time and set a place where I'm going to get alone with God. So if it's, if it's every eight o'clock every morning, I'm gonna have a date with God. It's gonna be coffee with God and you're gonna get away with him. Or maybe it's sometime in the evening or in the afternoon, maybe on my lunch break, every lunch break, I'm gonna go get away with God. For me, in this season, it's been prayer walks, and I've really enjoyed these prayer walks because here at the church, things are kind of quiet, not a lot of uh, people around, and so as I've been here alone, I've just found myself getting out and walking around the parking lot and walking around the yard here and just praying to, to God, just, just spending time with him, talking with him. So find a time, find a place. Martin Luther, uh, the great reformer, he said this about prayer. He said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That's how essential prayer is to the life of a believer. And, and so I'm not just saying only put it on the calendar, because if I was to only talk to my wife like once a day, hey, hey, Cammie, um, we're going to have a time together. We're at eight o'clock in the morning where we get together and we have our hour of talking if that's the only time I talk to my wife, we're, we're probably not going to have the best relationship. we got to connect throughout the day. That's why the Bible says to pray without ceasing. Like it's this continual uh, getting with God, but also making specific times to be with him. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Pray for the salvation of your friends. Pray uh, that God, would you save my friend who doesn't know you? Pray for a protection of people in the world right now as this pandemic is spreading worldwide and all over in every country on the planet right now. Pray for God to protect people. Pray for those who are infected to be healed and those um, who have lost loved ones to experience uh, healing. Uh, pray for our nation's leaders as right now is a very difficult time to lead our nation. Pray that they would have wisdom, that they'd make the right decisions. It's best for us if they make good decisions at, in responding to this pandemic. And so pray for them. Pray um, that this pandemic would actually spark revival, that there's something about this that would cause us to seek God anew and afresh and run to him in our nation. Um, that it'd spark repentance, that people would see the, uh, the brevity of life and repent and turn to God. Uh, pray for your church. Pray for your brothers and sisters at this faith family, that they would be strengthened and, and that they would endure. Pray uh, for God's provision, that God would provide for your family in these uncertain times, that God would provide for the church in these times. Just pray, pray. Um, and in, in 
while we're on the topic of prayer, hey, if you need prayer uh, right now, there's a, if you're watching this live Sunday at 10 a.m., there's a live prayer button, and we have people who are waiting for uh, you to pray for you. So if you have, need any prayer needs, even as the stream is going right now, just click that button, and we'd love to pray for you. And so we can pray. And then secondly, we can read. We can read the Word. Um, we can read the Word of God. We can get a word directly from um, the source. You know, right now we're living in a time where there's so many rumors going around. You hear rumors uh, about all the different things that might happen and, and all the different measures that might be taken and, and um, just rumors about everything. But here's really the best way to get the best information is to go to the source, to get to the, go to the person who wrote it, to go to the actual article, to go to the actual a source of the information. That is where you get the most reliable stuff, is if you go to the source. And I think right now we're overwhelmed with the amount of Bible teaching that's out there. And praise the Lord for good Bible teaching that is on the internet right now. All churches really have gone online. And so, so much Bible teaching is happening right now. And we can almost be consumed by preaching and devotionals and stuff that we neglect the actual source of these things. And so although there's great preachers out there and I'm benefiting from them, we don't only need to get fed from other preachers. We need to get fed from the source, from the word itself. The best thing is to get a word from God himself, personally. Let it grip you. Let it well up in you. Let it do something in you. Martin Luther again said this, um, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs to me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. That the, that the Bible is like living and active and it's gripping me is what he's saying. And so what does the word of God do for me? Well, in uh, Psalm chapter 19, one of the premier passages on, uh, about the Word of God. Psalm 19, verse 7 um, and on, uh, it's really six titles of Scripture, six descriptions of Scripture, and six results of Scripture. Let me just read it to you, and we're not going to be able to unpack all of it, but I just want to read some of it. The law of the Lord is perfect. This is Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the dripping of the honeycomb. I love that, okay? So here's the six titles, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the rules of the Lord. Those are all titles of the scriptures and then the description and result. And so I just wanna point out a couple of these. The law of the Lord is perfect, it's perfect which means that God is completely satisfied with his word. Like he's not going up, they're not in heaven right now going, man, I wish I would have said more about that. Man, I didn't see that coming. I, I, I wish we would have talked more about that. Maybe I wish we wouldn't have said that. I mean, that's not happening. The law of the Lord is perfect. Scripture is perfect. God is well pleased with his word right now. And it says that it is perfect reviving the soul. I love that. Maybe your translation says converting the soul. That it is perfect converting or reviving the soul. What this is, this is means that it transforms us. That it transforms us. Um, that the word of God has the ability to save people. You know, the Bible describes an unsaved person as not only uh, deaf and not only blind spiritually, but dead spiritually. Dead spiritually. And what this says is that the... Uh, law of the Lord has the ability to revive, to bring to life, to transform people, to bring dead, spiritually dead people to spiritual life in 
Christ. That's the power of the word of God. Maybe, do you remember a time? Do you remember a time when the word of God didn't move you, when you were cold to the things of God? Whenever you didn't understand it, whenever it didn't mean anything to you? And maybe today you, you so dearly treasure God's word and benefit from it, right? Because it's transformed you. It's transformed you and it's transformed me. But maybe not just transformation in the sense of salvation. Um, if you've ever felt spiritually cold or spiritually dry and you just feel like I'm, I just don't feel near to God, I feel like I'm not getting anything from God, Man, the word of God has the ability, come back to God's word afresh. It has the ability to, to transform your life, to transform your heart. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise uh, the simple. And so it gives wisdom. It transforms and it gives wisdom. Um, so the idea where it says that... Um, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. This idea of simple is a person who is uh, open, and uh, not the idea of open-minded, the idea of open to everything, that it, they're blown around by every idea. They hear a sermon, oh man, that's great, perfect, I'll go that, and, and then they hear a, a podcast, and oh, that sounds great, and they'll go over there, and then, oh, there's a conference coming, and they'll go over, I mean, it's like everything is swaying them, and they're very simple as far as open to all types of things. And, um, and the book of Proverbs it, it is really a book that tries, I'm nowhere in Psalms, but Proverbs is a, is a book that tries to give wisdom uh, to simple people, open people, to give wisdom to where you're more grounded and solid and understanding what God wants. And so say so it'll give you wisdom. I think we need wisdom right now. Maybe you're wondering, man, how do I lead my family through this? What financial decisions do I need to make? What decisions do I need to make with my, with my work and with my school and with my job? And, and, and you're, there's a lot of big decisions that have to be made. Maybe you lead an organization or maybe you lead a business or you lead something that you have to make decisions for groups of people and, and you need wisdom. I would say come to the scriptures. The scriptures give wisdom. The scriptures give wisdom. That's whenever we had to make the decision to move online, we, we sought the scriptures because the scriptures give wisdom. And we made our decision based on what the word of God says. And so uh, the scriptures give wisdom. Um, let's consume them. And then, and then finally in, in this passage, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. That the word of God brings joy. And don't we need some joy, right? Whenever everybody has a negative thing to say right now, when everybody is so doom and gloom, don't we need some joy? Well, joy comes from the Lord, and uh, the word of God is what's, what stirs your joy and what rejoices your heart. And if you need joy, come to God's word. Why does the word of God bring joy? It's because whenever I read God's word, I come to discover that... Um, that God is real, that he is in control, that he is sovereign, that he has a good plan for my life, and that he is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And although what's happening in our world right now is not good and we can't see it right now, he is working it together for the good. And so I got to, and, and that brings joy into my life. That brings peace into my life. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. It transforms and it gives wisdom and it brings joy and it does so much more than that. But we can still read the word and get into God's word. I love what uh, 2 T Timothy 3, 16 and 17 say about God's word. It says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. I love that. I, I love this first line, all scripture is breathed out by God. 
It's breathed out by God. God breathed the scriptures, which means that the Holy Spirit inspired them, that every word is breathed out by God, is inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by human authors, breathed by God. I love that. You know that, um, how close do you have to be to somebody to feel their breath? How close do you have to be to somebody? Like if somebody's breathing on you, you gotta be pretty close, right? Close enough to catch the coronavirus, right? That's how close you have to be. I think about sometimes whenever I'm, uh, Cammie and I are in, are in bed and we're laying down and um, there's sometimes where I'll turn uh, to where I'm facing her face to face with her and you know what she says inevitably almost every time? Quit breathing on me, right? It's something weird about breathing in somebody's face. And it's like what, what, it, what it means is you're a little too close right now. You're breathing my air, right? Because you have to be close to somebody to feel their breath. And um, we draw close to God whenever we are in his word. We draw close to him when we read his word word. And so we get close. We feel his breath. We read his word. You want to feel close to God? Get into his word. Get into his word. And uh, get a plan. Get a plan. Get a plan. You know, uh, you don't just jump in anywhere, right? Uh, The word of God has um, different levels of difficulty, okay? And so... um, So you want to get somewhere where you can start, and if you're just starting off and you want to get started, I would encourage you to go through a book of the Bible at a time, one chapter at a time, maybe read just a chapter a day. Um, I would say if you're just starting out, start in the book of John, in the Gospel of John. In the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start in John, and one chapter a day, one chapter a day. Get a plan. Choose a book of the Bible. Go through it one chapter a day, read God's word, consume it, delight in it, enjoy it. And I just want to tell you that um, sometimes whenever you read God's word, you can feel like sometimes you don't feel so happy about doing it. And this is what I like to tell people, is that with any spiritual habit, um, there is this progression. Uh, It's discipline, uh, desire, and then delight. Discipline, desire, delight. What it means is that whenever you first start reading the Bible, whenever you first start praying, whenever you first start any spiritual habit, you have to discipline yourself to do it. I'm going to decide to do it. I'm going to discipline myself to do it. But then after you do it for a little while, you begin to desire it. You begin to crave it. You know what? I kind of really want to go do that. I want to read now. And then you get to the place where you delight in it, where it's enjoyable and brings joy and delight to your heart. You start with discipline. Eventually, you'll desire it. And then, you will delight in it. Get in God's word. We can still read. Uh, Third, we can can, um, worship. We can worship. Now, worship is not just about a song or a place. Um, Worship is our lives poured out to God. I love this. I think it's so applicable to us right now, so relevant to us right now. In John chapter 4, Jesus encounters this woman at the well, and maybe you know the story where he's like, hey, go get your husband, and she's like, I don't have a husband. He's like, yeah, you're right, you've had five, and the one you're with now, you're not really married to, and, and you, know, you might know that whole scene, but um, after he kind of starts to tell her um, everything about herself, she gets a little nervous and, and tries to change the subject, and this is how she changes the subject. John chapter 4, verse 20. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but um, you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So what she does is she goes, "Um, you're making me uncomfortable. Um, Where do we worship? Where's the best place to worship? Verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit 
and in truth. So she's trying to start, she's like, there's a big debate on where do you worship? Where's the best place to worship? Where do you go to worship? What's the best church to worship in? And Jesus responds and he's like, I'm not concerned with where you worship as much as I'm concerned with how you worship. He says, we worship in spirit and in truth, which means that we worship with our heart engaged, with our spirit engaged, and with our mind engaged. We worship knowing who we worship, but it moves us. Our spirit's moved. So it's not about where we worship. And right now, we're not able to gather in large groups in this room and and worship like we're used to, but we can still worship because it's more about how you worship. You can still live your life poured out to God. Is your mind and heart fully engaged in your worship of the Lord? And so get creative with it, right? Or you, maybe sing a song. Uh, maybe play some music in your house. Um, put some music on. Get creative with how you're going to worship. But make sure that your heart and your mind and your spirit and your soul that you're engaged in this worship. Like earlier, it's so easy that in this church online to sit there and just watch Darren play some songs. But our desire is that you'd actually worship the Lord in these times that we share together, that your heart and your mind would be engaged, that that you would worship in spirit and in truth. So we can still worship. And then um, next one, we can build... Um, community. We can build community. Now this one probably looks a lot different, but we can build community. Um, There's this passage in Ecclesiastes that's read a lot of times at weddings. I've read it at weddings before. And and maybe you're familiar with this, but I think it, it speaks so much to our need for one another. In Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 through 12, it says this, to are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they can keep up warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, who will withstand him? A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so I think what it's saying here is that you can, you can get through life alone, but we are so much better together, that we're stronger together, that life is better together, the human experience is better if we're doing it together. And uh, this might look a lot different uh, in this time because we, we aren't gathering like we normally gather but we can still connect, we can still build community, we can still be there for one another. Maybe it's getting on FaceTime or Facebook or texting people. I have have had more text messages in the last week of my life than I have in my entire life. More text messages because, you know, we're just, we've moved to texting and, and people, as I've had the flu, people were checking on me. And thank you for praying for me. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you for praying for me. Uh, me and my daughter and my wife, we all got the flu. We're all over it now and doing a lot better. So thank you for your prayers for that. But in that time, a lot of people were texting and checking and calling and all of that's good. Um, so maybe call people. Um, maybe it's using Facebook Messenger um, or I, I just recently heard of um, someone who just went and did a front porch visit where they, they just showed up at their friend's house and, and uh, they hung out on the front porch and just visited for a while. Like, that's okay. Um, don't let this quarantine push you into isolation uh, to where you're not connecting with people. Reach out, connect with us, um, and, and connect with your uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, connect with your small group. You can still connect and build community. It just might look a little different. Um, I had a video chat with a friend this week. Uh, we normally meet in person, but this week we just got on video chat and spent about an hour. We used Messenger. Messenger is a great um, app for, for video chatting and stuff. And 
we got on and had a great visit, and it was good, good to connect with him. It's just looking a little bit differently. Um, my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, they came over, and we uh, hung out on the back porch. This is kind of as we were recovering from the flu. But we just hung out on the back porch and had a good time and enjoyed uh, each other's company. Like, it might just look a little different, but we can still build community. Don't isolate yourself. Don't isolate yourself. Life is better together. Reach out, connect with, with your community, build community. And then the final thing is this. So we, we can still pray, we can still uh, read, we can still worship, we can still build community. And the last thing is this. Uh, we, can, we can give. We can give. You can still worship through giving. Um, now, I'm uh, encouraged. I'm encouraged by the uh, amount of people who, who have been giving online, who moved to online giving since we're not meeting in person. But, but just because we're not meeting doesn't mean you can't continue to worship the Lord through giving. And I, I know um, some of you, maybe many of you, uh, are struggling financially right now. And your desire is to give, but you can't give as much as you once did and um and that's okay and i just wanted to encourage you for a moment you know jesus witnessed this widow giving her offering in matthew chapter 21 and this is what it says about this scene it says jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins and he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contribute out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty all that she had to live on. I just love that, that, you know, Jesus, he looked at the heart of the person giving, not the amount of the person giving. And it's even if you're giving a little bit, he, he knows if your heart is in it and he's going to bless it. And he's going to smile at that. Um, many times we feel like our, we have to give out of our abundance, but um, you can just give what you have. It's not the dollar amount that matters. It's the heart of the matter that really matters. Uh, I want you to see here that, that Jesus notices her gift, right? Isn't that cool? That Jesus notices her and, um, and he sees her and he's blessed by her. And, uh, and in the same way, I think he sees your gift, even if you're giving online, he sees it. He sees your heart. He sees your desire to, to be generous and to bless and to invest in the kingdom of God. And, and uh, he sees that. And so even if you have to give less than usual, God's going to bless you. God's going to bless you. He notices her sacrifice. Um, even now, when we can't put anything in the offering plate, God sees. God, God sees it. I think it's actually not in the uh, abundance where our generosity is tested. It's, it's whenever we don't have a lot, that's whenever our generosity is tested. How are we going to give whenever things are uncertain? That's a good question, something to wrestle with. And so if you want to give, you can give online, buyutala.com forward slash give. There's actually a giving link on this church online platform. Um, or you can give by text, by texting that number. Or you can mail in your um, contribution. If you give by check you can, or cash, you can mail it in and um, just mail it to the church office. And, uh, and we'll get that and, uh, and it'll be blessed. So thank you for that. I love what Philippians 4.17 says as Paul's writing to the Philippians and he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. He's, he's commending them for their generosity and he's like, it's not that I, I want your money. And even any of the, you that know me and know us here at Bayou Tal, you know that it's not that we want your money. That's not it. He says, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. That there's something that happens in you spiritually that there's a blessing that you receive spiritually whenever you're generous and whenever you give. And so we can still give, and you can give uh, of your time, and you can give uh, in serving people. We talked about this some last week, how you can serve your neighbors, and you can serve your parents, and you can serve the elderly, 
You can give your time and serve people. Um, I think this week, uh, Ron um, just showed up at my house. I, in previous sermons, I've mentioned how I have a, a big hole in my yard where I've, I've made this rut. Anyways, um, Ron knew it, and he can't showed up with a tractor full of dirt, and he dumped a bunch of dirt in this hole and packed it in. I mean, just randomly just serving. I mean, I was so blessed by that. And, and, you know, just think of creative ways that you can serve others in this season. And then we can give hope and peace to people. We can give hope and peace to people. Encourage someone. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There's several passages in Scripture that talk about exhorting one another, encouraging one another. I love how it says, exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. How long is it called today? Every day is called today, right? So he's like, all the time, encourage one another. Thessalonians uh, 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Proverbs 12.25 says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And so, you know, we can encourage people. We can encourage people means to give courage to people. Isn't that cool? You can give courage to people. You can give hope to people. You can give peace to people just by sending them a text or giving them a call or sharing something on social that's positive and encouraging. Um, You shouldn't share your germs with people but you should share your hope with people. I love how Jesus describes us as being a city on a hill, the light of the city, a city on a hill that just brings blessing and hope to the whole community. I love that. And then you can still give the gospel. You can still give the gospel. Um, We shouldn't back away from sharing the gospel with our friends, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, sharing how he's transformed us sharing how he died on the cross for our sins, paid the penalty for our sins, how he rose from the dead, how he offers us new life. You can still share the gospel with your friends. And so um, that's it. In this time where so much stuff is being stripped away, let's get back to the heart of worship, loving God and loving our neighbor. Loving God and loving our, let's get back to the basics. Let's strengthen our foundation of our relationship with the Lord. I hope this was a blessing to you. Let's pray together. Father, I just pray that you would use this word um, to encourage us, Lord, to strengthen the foundations in our life, to, um, to get back to the thing that really matters. When everything is stripped away, that we get back to the heart of worship, to the main thing. And I pray that we'd press into you in this time. And Lord, we pray that you would heal our country and heal our world. And we pray that you would heal those who've been affected by this virus. I pray that you would uh, get rid of it so that we can get back to our lives of gathering and worshiping you together. And Lord, I pray that this, this word would just be a blessing and sit with people, Lord, that we'd ponder these things and let them stir in our hearts. God, I pray that you'd bless these people and keep them. Make your face shine upon them and give them peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I love you, church. You have a blessed Sunday. God bless you. I'll see you next week. You are loved.